Okay, now we're recording. So I should start over. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, so the question of a long-term visa relates to a very basic question, which is how do you, when, when you seek an O or a P visa into the, U into the U.S., the artist needs to show that they have bona fide employment or plans for bona fide employment. Um, that's one of the two primary requirements for getting one of these visas. Now, obviously, because getting visas is really expensive and complex, you don't want to do it very often. So most artists want to get the longest possible term visa they possibly can because they don't want to spend the money and do the hassle of doing this repeatedly over the course of, of you know, over the course of a year, over the course of three years. Um, many years ago, and Mahmoud, you probably remember this, uh, a lot of agents, probably not all agents, but a lot of agents would just sort of, well, make stuff up. You make up an itinerary and say, this is what we're going to do. You'd stick it in there. There was a general sense that Homeland Security didn't care and it was fine. Um, but probably about 10 or 15 years ago, there started to be rumors of Homeland Security making calls and checking and calling venues to find out if uh, if the if the itineraries were true. And it kind of sent a shockwave and a reality check to a lot of people in the performing arts that, oh, wait, 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 wait. Those itineraries, those are probably fraud. Hmm, this is maybe not such a good idea to be submitting fraudulent documents to, the, to Homeland Security. Um, which led to a lot of discussions throughout the uh, the kind of visa world about like, so how would one go about getting a long-term visa? Um, so, but uh, before we really get into that, I want to take a second to talk about with, with both Huli and Mahmoud about, uh, the notion of a long-term visa and how, and whether in your experiences, that's been an important thing. Is it something you guys really prioritize or is it something that, um, you sort of leave up to the artist to, or, you, you know, Mahmoud, in your case, you leave up to the artist to worry about, Julie, believe in certain situations, do, like, is it something some artists worry about, some don't? Um, Mahmoud, as, a, as an agent, how how much is that a priority, the, the idea of getting a long-term visa for an artist? Um, it's a high priority because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's, it's a, a long process, it's an expensive endeavor, and um, if you have to do that every time that you have a tour, then you're adding these upfront costs that very well may exceed what you're grossing from the tour. So if you're able to spread that cost across, you know, forgetting about the term of the visa, but think of it as like an album cycle. If you can, you know, that's a one-time cost for album cycle, um, then you're not, as you said, you're not repeating that cost. The, uh, most of the artists that I work with are kind of in the rock, indie rock world, and it is album-oriented touring cycles, as opposed to maybe some uh, performing arts artists that are, you know, could just be over a broad calendar period. Um, so yeah, and, and it, it's very important to be able to get the longest visa so you can take whatever opportunities without having to have that expense, but almost more importantly, the time that it takes to process a visa. So if I have a foreign artist that, you know, is presented with an opportunity to support a larger act, um, you know, you've been offered the stadium tour, opening the stadium tour that's next month. Uh, the downside is it's going to take you 90 days to get a visa. If you had that visa in place, then, you know, it's, it's, it's just one last hassle. There's still many, many other costs to, um, to deal with for a foreign band touring uh, United States, but that's just one, you know, large cost, one time consuming bureaucratic headache that's just out of the way. Um, that said, you know, you'd reference 10 to 15 years ago, it was a matter of just providing uh, what we were taught to refer to as the intended itinerary. This is, you know, what we're, you know, what we're looking to do. And oftentimes, um, you know, for, for larger acts, you can plot out a year to three years because if you're an act that's in demand, you might have uh, festival offers multiple years in advance. You might have, um, you know, just, just special one-off events that would be, um, you know, booked out that far in advance. 
for a developing artist, you really don't know like what scale, what size of room, you know, where will you be and where will your finances be in two, three years. So um, the majority of my artists have focused more, as I said, on album cycle and that oftentimes ends up being the one year P, the P visas, which are still, you know, um, a substantial cost. Still, there's a lot of information that needs to be provided, but with the lead time for booking, um, you know, alternative rock, indie rock, uh, metal tours, that kind of coincides. We, we do know what's happening within a year uh, event-wise. So it's gravitated more towards what can we, um, what do we know we can secure? What length of time? And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of come down to being a one year, in some case, two year visas. But it's, it's for me, within the last decade, it's primarily been the P, um, the P visas. I, I do have um, a few artists too that aren't comfortable with projecting beyond a touring window. And if they know they're just going to be touring the U.S. Um, once in a calendar year, they'll just get the visa for the duration of the tour. So it's the the um, the uh, activity in the States that they can, uh, you know, prove through contracts. You know, the, if, if someone wanted to follow up on the legitimacy of an event, they can see it on ticketing sites, on venue sites. Um, but that does get expensive if you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars per tour. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, we can also add in recording studio time, um, you know, uh, publicity time, things like that. But it, it kind of does boil down to um, seeking the visa for the amount of period that you can show show work. Right. Sure. That makes sense. I know you mentioned artists feeling comfortable with uh, with what's being submitted. Willie, really, when you, you know, I, when I'm looking, when I'm working with artists, oftentimes the first time an artist is coming, they're coming for you know, a specific date, a specific short tour. It's, it's cycled with an album release in like their first release in the U.S. or something like that. And they're really only looking at a short period of time. If it's banned, you know, it's they're looking at, you know, three weeks of dates or something like that. And then oftentimes we see them again nine months later coming back saying, like, I, you know, I this things are starting to take off. I'm gonna we're coming back to do it again. And somewhere in that first 18 months, we start having a conversation with the artist or the management about well, well, well this is starting to work and we're like, what can we do so we don't have to pay this every time? In your experience or amongst your peers and colleagues, when do you feel like most artists who are, most non-US artists who are starting to work here, like what's that point at which artists uh, that you know or in your own experience start thinking in terms of like, I should probably be looking for a longer term visa than this being a one-off? Well, in my, my experience, because I came from like being taking education here in the U.S. So like I went from a uh, uh, student visa and I knew a lot of other international student visas. So when you graduate, you get something called an OPT. And I think the thought was it, it was like you have to do everything in your OPT year so you can get that artist visa. So obviously it's a different perspective because I do know people who have like try to like immigrate from scratch. They're like, I'm doing my art currently in this country and I will try and get that visa. Um, I think for most of the people, I guess probably because it's the people who will come to me and ask, uh, it's people who who like are thinking of it as like a one-time thing, less so bands like Mahmood was saying, where it's like they already have a tour, they have these specific dates, they wanna go to a specific cycle. Um, I think, yeah, it's more people who want to come and be able to live here because obviously from a booking standpoint, shows are really important and they're like your engagements. But when you're working as an independent artist, your work is so much more than than doing shows. Your work is producing albums, working with other musicians. It's a whole entire musical exploration. It's doing the assets, the photos for your albums and the videos and all of the stuff. So if you want to be working kind of like in the United States in general, I think that's when the long-term visa kind of really makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's, that's insightful. I think that um, with what Mamu was saying about artists being comfortable with it, is that a topic that you have encountered really with, with the people that you know, that, that question of like, I don't know what I should be submitting and, and what's safe, what's okay, what's going to get me in trouble? 
Yeah, I think there's a big fear and it's the the very overwhelming like how am I proving three years of contracted work and you know then you you know and then the question is how much of it is like fraudulent and made up or and I do remember because for my first visa I had never toured or anything and that's 11 years ago or something and we just copied a booking agent from another band. We copied the routing and we said we were going to do that routing and we got that visa. So obviously we can't do that anymore. We couldn't do that last time. Uh, I say we, cause it's me, a ba I have a band, it's me and someone else. I'm in the 01, they're in the 02 um, category. So, so yeah, people definitely are scared as to like what kind of things they can or can't present. How, how much can you get away with kind of right. thing? And I think that that brings up a couple really important topics. First of all, you mentioned that you're on an 01 and your band members on an 02, which um, I think probably a lot of people who are here understand the difference between those things, but that's a really important strategy that works for a lot of ensembles, doesn't work for every ensemble. But basically, if you're in a situation where there is a person in the band who has profile as an individual um, and is able to get an 01 and able to get the rest of the band and crew, if you want, on the O2, then that would be a way that for the cost of filing an O1 and O2 now, you can get a visa that can last for up to three years for the, the ensemble. Uh, there's a, there's, and it could also be multiple ensembles, which is an interesting part of it. So like, Mahmoud, I know you're talking about your, you've got people coming over on P's and that's kind of rough and ready, get a P every year. I've got bands that have been doing that for literally 30 years. They get their P, they get their P, they get their P. But I also, but there's also more creative ways to handle that. So for example, uh, there's an Irish musician we've worked with for years who does solo work. He's got a duo, he's got a quartet, and then there's another band that he often plays with. And when we, every three years, we file an O1 for him and then an O2 for everybody else. It's like half of Dublin goes on this other O2 and it's all the crew and all the musicians for all his different projects so that anytime he goes out during those three years, it's like you, you're the sound person, you're the drummer, you're the keyboardist, you're the, the trumpeter. Next tour, no, I just want you on piano and I want you on lights. Um, and that way he's got a whole stable of people he works with and everybody's all in on one pair of these. And that's a very efficient and cost-effective way to handle getting a long-term visa. But that doesn't really talk about how you do the long-term, but it is a cost-effective. It's, it's part of the process, part of the, the strategy yeah. of saving costs. Um, in terms of, and this is, I'm going to move sort of toward advice a little bit on this, and that's that um, for people who are trying to get the long-term visas, there's kind of two different important things to think about. One, when you're talking about employment, you're, you have to show that you've got something contracted that you're going to be doing in the U.S. And what Homeland Security is thinking about is they're thinking about gigs. They're expecting you to come with 10 contracts for 10 performances and an itinerary that lists those 10 performances, and that's it, over the course of two weeks, and you're done. That's, their, that's the paradigm they start from. But that's not the only way to do it. And it's also not the only kind of employment that they will consider employment. So oftentimes we'll work with an artist who will say, well, look, I've got an album, I'm signed to an American record label and I've got these five dates in June, but I'm gonna be doing writing sessions pursuant to that label contract or that publishing contract through the whole summer. I'm gonna be hanging out with my friends in you know, Santa Monica and we're gonna be writing songs. And then we're gonna be rehearsing through the fall. And all of that is part of that label. It's all pursuant to that label contract. And then we're going to be recording in the fall. And then probably around uh, you know, mid-autumn, we're going to do another run of dates. But I've got stuff that's all related to my label contract that is going to keep me in the U.S. for the next 12 months, 18 months, whatever it might be. So I think that one thing that we do a lot to get artists longer-term visas is think about what is the whole job of the artist? Not just a series of, of discrete gigs, but what are all the pieces that fall together that make up an artist's career? And what um, what do those things, uh, how can, what is the contract that underlies those? Can we use that back contract, that long-term contract to, um, to 
be the contract that the that the petition is talking about rather than discrete ones. Um, the other, the, all of this kind of goes back to um, an interesting case that went to through immigration court years ago, um, where it came out of the modeling industry actually, where uh, which us immigration lawyers refer to as the model case, um, where what happened was in the modeling industry, a model a model agency will have a group of models who work for them, but they aren't actually employed by them. They are just acting as their agent and they'll get a call from an advertising company saying like, we need a person with these specifications at two o'clock this afternoon on Madison Avenue, send them up. And the problem was that Homeland Security kept refusing visas for people because they said, well, you don't actually work for the modeling agency. You're just working for this, the contractor that you only have a few hours notice for. And the modeling agencies all got together and said, look, this isn't how the industry works. We don't have an actual end user contract until hours before the event. We can't do it that way. And Homeland Security came back with a memo that said, okay, you're right. That's now how it works. We are going to acknowledge the fact that there are agents who act as employers, even though they're not employers. They perform the function of an employer. And this was a really major watershed because what it opens up for the throughout the entertainment industry is this notion that you can have a relationship, an artist can have a relationship with an employer who isn't actually the end user, um, the end employer, the actual employer, as it were. Um, so, Mahmoud, when you were saying that, you know, you often, you're generally working out um doing your petitions through an agency or through a law firm when you're working with us chances are what we're doing is we're filing a petition where the contract that is showing employment isn't the gigs it's the contract between the artist and your agency mm -hmm. and that is is critical because we can say like yeah you've got every intention over the next three years to be booking this artist and that is the contract which we present to Homeland Security. And they're like, oh, okay, this is an engagement over the next three years. Um, and that generally works. They're still gonna want an itinerary, but then because that is the itinerary, because we've already submitted the contract and that is bona fide employment, the agency contract, the remaining, um, the the itinerary can be explicitly, these are the things that we expect to do, but they're not. we're not pretending they're confirmed or contracted. And that's the way that we typically are able to get around the notion. Uh, we can show that there's three years of employment or one year if it's a P1, even though the gigs aren't booked yet. And this is only possible because under US law, you can add or remove engagements in an itinerary over the course of a visa, even if, as, as long as the, the nature of the employment remains the same, in other words, you can't radically change what you're doing. If you're coming in as a musician, you can't suddenly like add in a bunch of gigs as a filmmaker or as a barber. But as long as the as long as the nature of the employment remains basically the same, then uh, you can add or remove engagements from the itinerary without having to file any petition. Um, so yeah. that yeah, go ahead. I might add, ask a question. So if that you know a contract between an agency and an artist that's for um, Multi years or whatever term, you would need to show itinerary as an activity for that term, or could it be this is what's happening within this first year, and then beyond that, this is what's projected. Okay. For that project for the projected dates, would we also need to show you know contracts, other uh, you know, um, uh, for lack of a better term, evidence of of those right. shows? You know, that's a good question, and and um, the. This is where I, we were, uh, the three of us were talking a little bit before the session started. Um, and one of the things we were talking about was the difference between what the law says and what happens in reality. Sure. And it kind of cuts both ways. Sometimes it's, it's to the advantage, sometimes it's not to the advantage of the artist. Um, what I find, Mahmoud, in this situation is if you're presenting, a, say, you've got, say what your itinerary is, is you've got five confirmed contracted dates in June. And then you know that you're gonna be coming back in September and October. And it's an 01, so you're, and you're planning to come back in March for some showcases and other stuff. And so you, you kind of know where it's going, but there's five contracted dates at the beginning. So the temptation 
is to give them those the contracts for those five confirmed dates, right? And the agency contract to make up for the rest of it. But what we find when that happens is they get confused. They get completely lost because there's- Which one is it? Which one is it? And if you show, if you give them an itinerary that has five, that's linked to five contracts, but all the rest of the gigs on the itinerary don't have any contracts, they're going to issue a request for evidence that says, well, where are the, where are the contracts for all, for the remaining, you know, two and a half years? So even if we have contracts for those confirmed shows, we would not include them. Okay. Uh, with that, if we're filing, if the authority under which we're filing is the, the employment here is the relationship between the artist and the agency, we would file with only that contract because anything else is just going to mess with their heads and they're going to get confused. So um, you're saying a long-term contract between an artist and an agency and then a long-term intended itinerary right. rather than getting specific to, you know, the way that um, my artists have been approaching P1s, like here's the evidence, that's your visa. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think this also raises a kind of a question about how, sorry, Khalil. Well, I have a question. In that scenario, is your agent your petitioner or not necessarily? So that's a really good question. And I'm really glad you brought that up because it raises a couple of interesting questions. Um, and I don't want to pit the two of you against each other as the, as the artist and the agent. But in most situations, yeah, the 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 agent would then become the would be the petitioner. Um, problem is for an artist is if your agent is your petitioner and the only contract that's being submitted is your relationship with that with that agent, then if that relationship falls apart. The, the contract that underlies your petition is void and therefore your petition is probably, I mean, there's, there are certain ways to get around it, but in general, if the whole point of the petition is to enable you to do this contract with this agency and that agency relationship falls apart, then chances are your visa will be invalidated. Um, After it's been approved within that, within the terms? Well, this is the thing. It's, there is no real mechanism to do it. It's just that, say, say you, who you are assigned to Moonwood's agency, and you get your th three year O one, and then a year into it, something terrible happens. You guys are not getting along, and you're like, okay, I'm out of here. Or Moonwood, you're like, okay, I'm done with you. Whatever it might be. Of course, this wouldn't happen with you two. You're both lovely guys. But <laughs> should it happen, um, the problem is then, who you wouldn't know what. Mahmoud has done and you could easily have sent a letter to Homeland Security saying like she's not working for me anymore and I think her visa should be invalidated and sometimes that letter gets lost and no one ever sees it but I've also seen situations where I get a letter of revocation from Homeland Security saying we have been notified that this artist is no longer working with the petitioner and because you'll never be notified um you won't know you don't know you have no idea of knowing until you come into the U.S., you know. And they deport you. <laughs> a year and a half later and they <laughs> deny you entry because, oh, it looks, we've got a, we've got a red flag on your visa says you can. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's the, the danger of doing it this way is that it does link you to an agent. Now, yeah, there's that, particularly that, wrong that with circumstance, that. So, sorry, did you, yeah, no, go for that it. circumstance just is in a scenario where the agent after an mm -hmm. agent artist relationship is is dissolved that they're uh almost out of like vindictiveness or going sure. actively doing it it's not it's you uh homeland security isn't monitoring no. artist contacts and being like oh this is no longer your age it's not an automated process it would take um it's not a passive process but it's something that i actively would have to engage that yes and no there's no um, there's no mechanism uh, where they would monitor it, but mechanically by law, if the contract is void, then the visa is void. And this probably doesn't make much sense, or doesn't make much difference, except uh, say you've got a dozen O2s that are on your that are connected to your O1 really, and 
the drummer, because it's usually the drummer, um, is coming in at JFK and the officer says, hey, uh, I see you're coming on tour. Yep. Uh, working with concerted efforts. Oh, no, man, we dropped them. Oh, We're not yeah, working yeah, with concerted yeah. efforts anymore. And then, unfortunately, the drummer was the first person in line at the airport, and mm -hmm. everybody else is lined up with their gear behind, and the officer clocks what's happened and says, wait a minute, you're not working with them anymore? Well, then this visa isn't valid, and puts them all on a plane and sends them. And then and also there's a circumstance yeah. which a circumstance in which um, an agent is an agency. So they're still maintaining that relationship with the artist, but their, you know, their agency has changed. How does that uh, impact things? Like say in that circumstance, right. uh, drummers like, oh no, my mood's at blah, blah, blah now. Uh, right. Does that set up a red flag or is that? It, it does, but here's, so we're starting to get into, we're, the whole point of this webinar was to get into the weeds and we're definitely getting into the weeds here. In the film industry, this happens a lot. And what people do is what's called a loaned labor agreement. Say, for example- Could you say that again? A loaned labor agreement. So if, for example, Mahmoud, you left concerted efforts and started your own agency and it was all amicable and everybody's cool with it, concerted efforts could sign a letter that says we have effectively transferred the rights and the responsibilities related to your role as a petitioner on Bullies 01 to this new agency. And just having that on file will be useful if there's a problem, especially if it's a problem when you're trying to get a visa at an embassy. Um, because if you go to the embassy and the embassy is like, it looks to me like you like aren't you know, something, you know, your relationship fell apart and you were working with a different agent. I found that on Google and you can say, no, here's my loan labor agreement. That's not really what happened. It was all cool. Um, it's a little bit more sketchy if you're arriving at three in the morning at JFK and you're trying to convince an officer like, no, I've got this little piece of paper that says I don't, you know, so um, it's all a little bit legally it's fine in practice it gets kind of sketchy at that point so um, um so, uh no, you go ahead i think my what i'm about to say might be more of a tangent sorry we're all about tangents here today i do want to look at the questions see if anybody has asked uh i see one here hello i've heard that no one visa being renewed for longer than one Heard of an O-1 being renewed. Is that possible for performing a visual artist? How can you get a renewal for longer periods as well? Okay, this is a really confusing thing. Uh, the statutes say that an O-1 can be renewed for only year increments. Which is true. If, for example, Mahmoud, you filed a petition, you were the petitioner, for one of your artists who has an O-1 and they want to extend that O-1, you could file up to one year of an extension of their stay in the U.S. And they would be able to continue working. And this is really, you're thinking in the context of somebody who's remaining in the U.S. They're not leaving, coming back on tours. They're, they're remaining in the U.S. So when they say you could extend a, a, an O-1 for a year, You've got your three years, you can extend the stay for another year, and then another year, and then another year. But in terms of extending the the duration of the visa, you if you were to use, if that same artist were to file a new petition with a different petitioner, or even checking a box that says it's different employment, even if it's the same petitioner with a different contract, they could right out of the gate get another three years. So, um, so to your question, yes, we would, I don't think we would ever, I mean, technically when they're saying an extension, what they're talking about is an extension of stay in the U.S. They're not talking about the duration of the visa. So I would never file, I would try everything I could to avoid a situation where I was, where a client of mine is looking to get another three years. I would not file it as an extension because I might be limited to the one year if they want to use the same petitioner. Rather, I would file an all new petition and at some point, they're going to have to leave the U.S. and get a new visa and come back in on that. But that's easier in most situations than repeatedly getting another year. Did that make sense? 
So, yeah, and you just addressed a question that I, that I had when you're talking, referring to extending the stay. That is a foreign artist that is based in America for an extended period of time. If that person gets that one year extension rather than a new petition, they fly out of the country and then when they come back, their their visa is no. Is, does that mean that they um, they can't leave? The country? They can't leave. Is is it is is that the scenario? I'm sorry. Try that. Again. Just let's go over those the the fact pattern again. If, if, you, if you if you get the one year extension, mm -hmm. are you can you leave the country? Or if you leave the country, can you only return within that year? Or is that okay? So a visa is an entry document, right? And it it's like a key. It has a certain duration, and during that duration of time, you're allowed to enter the U.S. In most, for most artists, that the duration of stay is also the duration of the visa, but that doesn't always work that way. Like for example, Brazilian artists are only able to get a one year visa. Actually it might be three months at this point, but at any rate. So that means they've got a little window in which to work. When their visa issue is issued, it's a, it's a narrow window and they have to enter the US during that time. But the petition, the duration of the stay can be up for up to three years. So they can remain after the visa expires if their stay is in, indicates that they can remain for the three years. So for, for Brazilian 01, you often get a three-year um, approval, but they have to got to enter right at the beginning of it. And if they leave, then they have to go and get a new visa, even though they don't have to get a new petition filed. Because the petition lasts for three years, the visa expires in three months. Did that make sense? Sort of? Yeah. Sort of. But, but I should take a moment here just for everybody that that what Thomas Dot does is a nonprofit and we provide pro bono legal assistance to questions like these. And part of when we're going down these weed, these these weedy holes, um, if you have a question as an artist, as an arts presenter, as an agent and you're getting into the thick of this, you should always feel free to reach out to us because chances are this falls within the scope of what Thomas Dot will do pro bono and we can just answer those questions for you. This stuff, when you're talking about extensions, it's it, it's very possible that, that it can get really complex and very case specific. It's actually different for different countries. Um, Canadians are different than Brazilians are different than um, than the rules for Germans, which are different than the rules for North Koreans. So the purpose of this part of the conversation is more to let you know that there's a lot of complexities and variations out there. And it's always good to check if you're getting into the world of extensions. So the, uh, the tangent that I was going to go down is actually a question that's uh, that's been asked. And what, what I was going to ask is, for this O-1 visa for up to three years, um, you know, I have ingrained in my in in my uh, visa experience that for even for a year long P-1, we need to show, um, I've, and my numbers might be incorrect, but six to eight weeks of activity every six to eight weeks. Maybe that time frame is is uh, is different. But someone had asked, um, in your experience, what is the largest itinerary gap that can be present on a petition for a long term visa? So, um, yeah, what's, what, what are the, uh, the guidelines there? Okay, so um, this is a hard question. So there's no, there's no rule about that. This is a rule of thumb. And so any answer I give you is going to relate to our, the best guess of what the average officer is going to be fine with. Okay. Um, what the rule actually says is that Disparate activities of engagement that are separated by a period of time can be on one can be uncovered by one visa or one petition, provided that the activities between those periods of time, between those engagements in the US, are, this is the quote, incidental or related to their employment. Now, I don't know what would be not incidental or related. Incidental, having a sandwich, going on vacation. Related, rehearsing, recording, writing. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything in an artist's life is either incidental to or related to their employment, right? Um, so what we'll do 
when we're filing when when we're filing a petition based on performance contracts, again, we're setting aside the notion of uh, of an agency contract because if you've got an agency contract, you've got a contract, and so the gaps in the itinerary should not make any difference because the employment being contemplated is the agency employment. But say we're filing a petition based on multiple uh engagement contracts you know with for performances what should be the longest gap i've done gaps of up to eight months ten months but what i've done is on the itinerary i'm going to explain what that artist is doing outside the u.s mm -hmm. during that time so it might be like i've got five shows in, in june july august they're on vacation that's incidental september october november they're on tour in europe December, January, February, the recording in in Sao Paulo. March, they're going to be back. April, May, June, they're going to be on vacation and working on doing a residency program in Rabat. And so, what I'll do is I'll lay out a whole itinerary. Now, I don't have contracts to underlie all those things because those would the outside the U.S. things because that would just confuse an art, it'd confuse Homeland Security horrifically. But as long as I'm explaining what it is and sort of tagging each one, this is incidental, this is related, this is incidental, this is related, mm. um, then the gap can be quite long. And theoretically, it could be as long as you want it to be because they've said the duration of the gap shouldn't matter. In practice, the longer the gap, the more likely you're going to have an officer who's going to take issue with it. Um, five, ten years ago, they were much harsher on this. They've gotten a lot more lenient as they've realized, well, first of all, as this kind of documentation explains why it's within the law for there to be big gaps. Um, and there's a lot more understanding amongst most officers that the reality of the industry means there can be very significant gaps, but that doesn't mean that the activities in the U.S. are not related and should be allowed under one position. Um, that being said, if you're Canadian and you're working with the unions to get a P2 visa, the union's policy is much more strict on that front. And they want to avoid this whole game. And so they tend to say, I think it's 30 days or 45 days that they don't want to see a gap of more than that on their P2 um, itineraries. But that's for P2s specifically. Okay, that was 45 minutes of ranting. Your questions are amazing, you guys. This was really good. It was exactly what I was hoping was going to happen. But I want to make sure that we leave time for audience questions. Um, there's the question about gaps that Liz asked. Liz, was that a decent answer? Did that give you what you were looking for? Yes. Yes. Um, that's definitely what I was looking for was your experience. Uh, I know you can't predict what everyone is going to approve or not approve, but that's helpful. Okay. Yeah, and there's always this question that I think everybody has to has to grapple with, which is, do you want to shoot for a more adventurous petition that goes for like the full three years, or do you want to do the really safe thing? Like, well, we'll definitely have situations like the movement you're talking about, where an artist is like, I don't want any risks, I don't want any complexity, I want a petition that's you know, three weeks covers my twelve dates. I don't want to mess with it, and it has to do with risk aversion. And how much time you've got. Do you have time for a request for evidence? These kinds of matters are almost always resolvable. Um, if if a request for evidence challenges it, you can almost always fight back and say, like, no, look, this is what you guys say. This is how the rules are supposed to work. But if the time is really tight with the petition, then you might not have time to risk risk the delay of a request for evidence and you might want to do a less adventurous petition. What, what would be the, um, sorry to, before we jump into that no, question, go for it. what would be the lead time one should uh, should have for time for the O1? Um, O's and P's are going to be the same. The okay. processing time is essentially the same. Right now, I mean, that varies so much depending on the wind, as far as I can tell. But right now, uh, the Vermont Service Center is processing most petitions in between two and three months, more, more around two months. The really challenging piece right now, and it has been this way since the pandemic, is what used to be very simple, which is the getting of a visa, the going to the embassy, doing your interview, the turnaround time, which used to be pretty much standard. Certainly in the global north, it was standard yeah. of like a couple of a couple of weeks would be plenty of time to get an interview, get in, 
get your passport back. Um, historically, especially during the Trump years, there tended to be more delays in the global south while there's security checks being done and an initial denial that you've got to try again and all that kind of crap. Um, but since the pandemic and a general really kind of collapse of a lot of the person, like the staffing of U.S. embassies, we have seen, uh, and also issues the State Department has been struggling with personnel-wise with Afghanistan, Ukraine, especially in Europe, there are so many delays at embassies mm. in getting visas issued. It's worse in Europe than the rest of the world, but um, there are a lot of embassies. It's getting better slowly in the last six months. It's starting to get better at the major embassies, London, Paris, Berlin. Um, but still a lot of embassies, if you go on the website and say, I want to do a visa interview, the soonest appointment will be May 24. Yeah. Uh, and you know, what you have to do is you take that May 24 appointment and then click on the box that says, I need an emergency interview and ask for something sooner and hope they respond. Um, but to your question, what's the lead time? You have to know what's going to happen at the embassy and what that specific embassy is doing. Mm -hmm. Like if it's Kiev, I wouldn't figure it's going to happen very soon, you know? Yeah. So uh, my general like rule of thumb for, you know, conjecturally to artists is three to six months. Um, and uh, it's my understanding that it won't even be taken uh, more than six months out. And for me, like that's kind of like the window of advanced planning for a singular tour. Um, and to address what you're saying about uh, embassies being backed up, I know a lot of people in the UK are going to Belfast rather than London to try and actually get, get appointments. Um, with this, uh, say you have an artist, say I have an artist that has a P1, we want to look towards the future of applying for an O1. Can you apply for an O1 while you have an active P1 or does that duration have to run out? No, you can totally do that. In fact, you can file another P O1 while you're current O1. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's not a problem at all. They're different classifications. Ah. Yeah. I have a particular question. Um, so obviously there's the, the timing, the prep timing that you should have for the visa, uh, but there is also the premium processing fee, which means that your petition won't be looked at it in two to three months, but I believe it's two weeks or something. Two weeks, yep. Um, do you feel that that like changes kind of the chances or the possibility that they'll ask for a request for evidence or not at all? We haven't seen any statistically significant difference in the processing, which is sort of cool. Like. You kind yeah. of don't want it to be like, I give you $2,500 and I got a better chance of getting a visa. Um, it doesn't appear to be like that. People will claim otherwise, but we have a pretty pretty big sample and we don't really see. Um, there's a comment here that I just saw somebody ask. Uh, what about questions. the interview waiver that they've provided since? Okay, so that's an interesting question. And it's something I wanted to touch on before we leave this. Um, Many of the embassies, well, all the embassies having have expanded in order to try to deal with their backlog, they've expanded the number, the, the eligibility for a lot of people to apply for the visas without having to do an interview. You can, it's a mail-in option. Um, if you have lots of time, certainly that's advantageous. If you're eligible and you've got lots of time, that's certainly advantageous because then you don't have to go wherever the embassy is. And in some countries, the embassy is very hard to get to. It's very far away. Um, so that's a really good option. Be aware that at many embassies and consulates around the world, the processing time for the mailing is significantly longer than the processing time for the in-person interview. So we find ourselves in urgent situations, frequently having an embassy said, hey, you're eligible for the mail-in. We're like, no, 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 no. We don't have time for the mail-in. We have to do that. We have to do the interview. Um, so... While it's tempting because it's easier, be careful if your artist is, if the, if the time frame is tight, because it might actually cause you more problems than it's worth. But that's a really good question, Julie. Uh, and Stacy had a question here. I'm working with a theater company that would bring one production for run in New York City in October and a different production for a three month tour from January to March. There is little overlap in the cast and crew, but the majority of the people are only working on one production. That is not an easy question, Stacey. Um, <laughs> it's not easy because 
because the law is unclear about what the intent of it is. There is um, there is some indication that we had a situation recently where there was a theater company and had two separate troops that were doing the same production and they wanted them to be touring simultaneously in the US, which means they were going to have dates on in two different places on the same night and they were like why do we want to do this under one petition and they're like well it might work because the renown is the same as long as 75 percent of the artists have been with the company for more than a year you've met the 75 percent rule but it's also possible an officer is going to look at them and be like this is not they are not these individuals are not performing as a unit they're performing as two different units I don't know how you would file the petition as two separate ones, because that suggests that one of them is fraudulent, one of that. So it's it's a really tough question. Um, and Stacy, I feel like we're already talking about this by email, um, but uh, it, but I think this is so specific, you'd really want to look at exactly what the itinerary is, and you'd have to do kind of a judgment call. It's sort of there's no good answer to this, because either you're going to sort of try to pretend that it's one ensemble, or you're going to pretend that it's two separate ensemble. I mean, do it that way. Pretend it's one ensemble and file a single petition and try to hope they don't notice that it's two. Or file two separate ones, pay more, and kind of hope that they don't notice that it's actually one. Like, there is no <laughs> particularly good answer for that. Because I kind of landed on just doing them separately, even though it's painful if we have to expedite both of them. Because I, you know, if it were one tour with like a big gap we could just sort of explain what everyone's doing in between that would be fine we've done that plenty but i'm just i was i was wondering if there's any i don't know if there's any well, the downside of it is like imagine if they got a petition for the rolling stones right and they're like okay cool that's it's the rolling stones you're doing this tour and then they got another petition for the rolling stones for an entirely different set of dates they'd be like wait a minute one of these is not the real rolling stones and so that would be the rfe that i would worry about if you separate them even though they're different periods if they're different are, periods, they oh, they're totally different periods, then it probably would be fine. Okay, I hadn't even thought to worry about that, so. <laughs> okay, but uh, follow up with me about that, because I think there's there's some, yeah, follow up with me about that by by email, if you haven't already, and I feel like, I feel like I've Oh, I sent you an email about a way dumber, sad, stupid situation that, yeah. This All right, but we'll get to that. <laughs> um, is there somebody, somebody had a question, I think. Uh, I have a couple of notes of things that are uh, kind of questions. Go for getting, it. getting back on the uh, filing for an O1 while you have a P1, um, say your O1 is denied, um, can you then immediately file for a P1 with like specific dates? Um, you know, assuming you have some some lead time, uh, having a having a denied visa, um, what does that mean for future applications? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. So first of all, if you have time, then I mean, meaning that you've got plenty of time. If you get a request for evidence, it doesn't mean you're going to suddenly have to drop twenty five hundred dollars on premium processing, or you've already committed to premium for premium processing. Um, there's not there's no particular harm in going for the long duration and filing a petition that is explicitly speculative, even if you know that the, the, the a, a mean officer might come back. Because what you could always do is you can always say, okay, look, fine. I'm not going for the full three years. I really just need these six weeks. And in the in the request for in the response to request for evidence, you know what? Change plans here. Here are this here's 12 contracts over six weeks. Let's just go for those six weeks. And they will be like, all right, fine. Forget about the rest of the three years. We're giving you a six-week visa. You can, you can kind of change course with a request for evidence, and they generally are not going to do that. If you have a petition denied, unless they deny it because they think something's untoward has happened, it's usually it's almost always a denial without prejudice, which just means we're not convinced that you're famous enough, or we're not convinced that enough of these engagements are confirmed. So we're just gonna deny it. And that opens up the possibility of just applying again with better evidence. Um, it's not seen as a character flaw. In other words, just getting a denial. If for some reason they're like, they open a fraud investigation and you know claim that like 
we have determined that the that you are fraudulently submitting an itinerary of fake dates at non-existent venues, that could be a denial with prejudice and that could make future petitions harder. Um, my last question in the O1 versus P1 for you, um, what are differences in costs, generally speaking? Um, the differences of costs, well, the, any petition, um, you know, the, 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 there are fixed costs, the filing fee of the petition, and we haven't even talked about the, the notion that that might go up. Um, filing fee, fee of the petition, the union consultation, those are fixed costs. The cost of hiring somebody, a lawyer, an agency to prepare and file these, that's another thing. And that's mm -hmm. depends on who you're, I mean, I've seen law firms charge $10,000 for an O1. I've also seen, non-lawyer agents charge a thousand dollars to do a p1 so the the that range is a market question um the main difference is if you've got five musicians and no crew and you could put them all under a p1 or a p3 well that's one petition that's not very expensive i mean it's comparatively less expensive than an o1 and an o2 which is two petitions which more or less is going to double the costs okay um, some attorneys will give you a a break on the O2 because it's seen as simpler than the O1. A lot of them don't. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have one last very simple question. Go for it. Um, is there a limit to how many O1s you can get? Can you get O1s over and over? Because I think you people can. move here and once they've moved here, you can. maybe you if can. they make their life here. So yeah, you go. totally can. Uh, you can do it indefinitely. Um, you you will have to change petitioners or change employment in order to get the three year each time. But a lot of artists, some very, very famous artists who have been living in the US for decades are doing it on, on a, an O1, not moving to the green card because the green card requires residency. You have to spend at least half the year in the US when you're on a green card in most mm. situations. And a lot of major touring artists or some very major touring artists who are you know from the UK but they're mostly living in LA don't want to be in a situation where they have to spend six months of the year in the US because they might be on tour or they might be living at their estate in south of it France is. or whatever it might be right um so yeah there are certainly artists who just mm -hmm. do this stay on the old one almost indefinitely Wow. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. I think we're out of time. Um, I hope that was useful. Uh, Krista, Willie, from the APAP crew, and Gay, thank you for what you've done today. Mahmoud, Willie, thank you so much for being great prompts. This worked way better than I expected it was going to be. So that was really thank good. Thank you. Um, and oh, wait, Boo is saying we have a few more questions, a few more minutes if there are questions. Are there any other questions? Drop them in the chat or shout them out if you want to. Oh, Boo's pointing out we have until 4.15. I think we're kind of done, I think, unless anybody has more questions. All right. Yeah. <laughs> You guys are the best. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Matthew. Goodbye. Bye, Bye Mahmoud. Nice Thank meeting you. Me.